Hello and welcome to Battlecast, the show where we talk about the greatest battles in history and drink beer. I'm Luke and I'm joining the bunker with the man voted most likely to be heard in the bushes outside your window. I'm talking about Chris, ladies and gentlemen. Chris, say something to the people. Eh, nobody minds a little light stocking, as all your previous girlfriends get testified. Oh, sh- shut up, man. All right, dude. We've got another listener email from the great state of Maine. John wants to know, why don't we post battle maps on the website? That, why don't we, Luke? That sounds like a pretty good idea and what somebody with a history podcast would do. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't normally create podcasts every day. All right, John, point taken. We've started posting them with the show notes on the website, I believe, at the Battle of Atlanta or the Battle of Kenai. Yeah, remember. don't worry, John. I'm going to beat him. <laughs> go I've got a stick. <laughs> he does have a stick. Check it out at thebattlecast.com. All right, this month we are wrapping up our series on the greatest battles of the Second Punic War. Tonight, Hannibal Barca faces his greatest challenge, one of Rome's greatest generals. I'm talking about Scipio Africanus. We're talking this month about the Battle of Zama. But before we can get into that, we have to do the things women love their husbands to do more than anything else. You mean ripping a loud one in front of the in-laws and blaming it on the dog? (laughs) No, crack open a few cold ones. Now, a lot of our new listeners don't know this, but we always drink beer from the battle location. That's why tonight we're drinking Keltia Beer Deluxe. Keltia Beer Deluxe is brewed in Tunisia by French brewery Société de Fabrication des Boussons de Tunis. Keltia is a pale lager that pours an amber brown. The beer comes in at 5% alcohol. Keltia is the only beer brewed in Tunisia. And I want to thank Jeremy for gifting this beer to us here at Battlecast. Thank you guys so much for the donations. Cheers to everybody in the audience. Chris, what do you think about this beer? Uh, it tastes pretty good. I like it. It's uh, malty. It's got, got a lot of good flavor to it. i got to say, this is a very malty beer. I'm not getting the Newcastle. It, yeah, it is a brown beer. I, I, I can see that. I'm getting a lot of malt notes. Uh, this is something I really didn't expect from a Tunisian beer, to be honest with you. This is actually a lot better than I expected after some of the beer we drink on this show. I had very low expectations. Yeah, Sweetwater Blue. Blah. <laughs> Blah. This awful. is this is an okay beer. I'm going to give it 2.5 bullets out of 5. I wouldn't mind if I never saw this beer again. But if I was on an island in Tunisia and this was all I had to drink for three months, I'd make do and remember Hebrews 13, be content with what you have. And that's just what I'm going to do tonight. Well, well, Luke, I like it. I'm going to give it 3.5 out of 5. It's a fantastic beer. Uh, it's much better than a lot of the other stuff we've drank on this podcast. That's the truth. All right, and with that, we're going to dive into the Battle of Zama as we taste a little bit of Tunisia. Hannibal continues his fight for nine long years. Then, a delegation from Carthage arrives at Hannibal's camp with devastating news. Scipio has conquered Spain and has now invaded Carthage. The delegation insists that Hannibal return home. Hannibal could say, No, Carthage, you're on your own. You've left me on my own. You haven't helped me. You are on your own. Sort yourselves out. I'm going to Crete. I'm going into retirement to live off the pension you don't send me. Did he know he went back? Why? Because this game wasn't over and he had to just see it out. It must have been extraordinary for Hannibal to return to Africa for the first time since he was nine years old. After having had another life in Spain and another life in Italy, No doubt there was something of a letdown to go back to Africa and something of a shock uh, to go back to Africa, a land he hardly knew. But Hannibal being Hannibal, he set himself to the task at hand to defeat the Romans in battle. Hannibal doesn't return to the city of Carthage directly. In the surrounding countryside, he sees the devastation wrought by Scipio's new Roman army. Towns and villages are in ruin. Fearing the Romans will destroy the city itself, the Carthaginian council is on the brink of surrendering to Scipio. But with the return of Hannibal, they change their minds. The 
The year was 202 BC, five years after Hasdrubal Barca's crushing defeat at the Battle of Matoris. Hannibal is still raging across the Italian peninsula, leading some of the most battle-hardened men in human history. It's been over 14 years since the Battle of Cannae, where he massacred more Romans in one day than the United States lost in the entire Vietnam War, and he still is threatening Rome. The Second Punic War has dragged on for 16 long years. 16 years, as long as it takes a child to get a driver's license. 16 years? What's he been doing the whole time? (laughs) Well, he's been holed up at the heel of Italy a lot of that time. So he's just just building his own little kingdom? Kind of, he's consolidating power. We talked about this at the Battle of Cannae, how he, all, a lot of his early conquests led to many city-states coming over to him, and since he couldn't defend them all because he didn't have enough troops, he concentrated that population to the heel of Italy and Make protects it. Easy to defend. He just needs more troops because if he leaves those people that he's protecting, mm-hmm. the Romans will come in and take them over, and he's promised them protection. That's the problem. He doesn't have enough troops to get the job done. Uh-huh. I really believe if he had the troops, he'd get the job done. All right. Well, anyways, back to the Battle of Zama. It took place on October 2nd, 202 BC, and would decide the fate of the Second Punic War, the fate of the Carthaginian and Roman empires, and the fate of much of our world today. But before we dive into the battle, we need to compare the two great men on whose shoulders rest such heavy loads as if they carried the world on their shoulders. And if we are going to believe Carl Schmitt and Friedrich Nietzsche, each civilization considers itself, its values and systems, its religion, the way it views the world, to be the very center of the world. They did carry worlds on their shoulders. One was Carthaginian, the other Roman. Only one world would continue. Okay, it's time for General versus General, the part of the show where we compare the generals who will be facing each other. We have Master Strategist Hannibal Barca. Now, the last time we saw Hannibal was 14 years earlier at the Battle of Cannae. During these 14 years, Hannibal has ranged across the Italian peninsula, defeating Roman armies and taking Roman allied cities, but never laying siege to Rome itself. Here's how Roman historian Livy described Hannibal at this time. Quote, Hannibal was born in the army headquarters of his father, one of the bravest generals in the world. Brought up and educated in the profession of arms, a fighting man while still a boy, a general when barely out of his teens, and now with enough victories to his credit for an old man, though only 45, had he not filled the provinces of Spain and Gaul, the land of Italy, from the Alps to the Straits of Messina with the monuments of all his mighty deeds, furthermore... He led an army whose length of service matched his own, an army hardened by sufferings beyond human capacity to endure, an army steeped a thousand times in the blood of Roman armies and enriched with the spoils of generals, not just normal soldiers. Many of those who would come to face to face with Scipio in battle had themselves slain praetors, generals, and Roman consuls with their own hands. Many would be crowned nobles. Many had wandered at leisure through captured camps or Rome's surrendered cities. All the flags of Rome's magistrates today would not equal those which Hannibal can now display, captured from Rome's dead military commanders. End quote. And squaring off against Hannibal is Roman consul and general Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. <laughs> Cornelius. <laughs> Very juvenile, Chris. <laughs> you know, he gets emails where people say they like these little comments. Oh, everybody likes Cornelius. <laughs> All right. Funny. Back to Scipio. He is a veteran Roman military man, not a politician. He fought in and survived the ill-fated Battle of Cannae, where he saw his father-in-law and consul, Lucius Paulus, disemboweled with a spear. I want you to imagine him coming home and telling his wife her father was massacred by the Carthaginians. Imagine her cries and pleas for vengeance on the Carthaginians, each tear and sob piercing into Scipio's heart. Hannibal had killed Scipio's own family. Hannibal had almost killed Scipio. For Scipio, the Battle of Zama is personal. Well, I mean, it's just his father-in-law. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to... Sometimes disemboweled their followers off with a spear. <laughs> All right, well, listen. Scipio, like Hannibal, hated his enemy with an unmitigated hatred. When Rome sent Scipio to fight Hannibal, they sent fire to fight fire. I want to tell you a story that captures the determination of Scipio. Ooh, a story. 
<laughs> After the Battle of Kanai, there were many young nobles who were rich that were thinking of buying a ship and fleeing to a foreign king because they considered the Roman cause doomed. When Scipio heard this, he flew into a rage, entered into the meeting of the young nobles, drew his sword, and threatened with death any man that so much as spoke of leaving, leaving Rome. Here's how Livy describes this dramatic event. Quote, many thought Rome was already given over dead. Some of the young nobles were looking to the sea and ships, proposing to abandon Italy. These evil tidings stunned those who heard them. When they would have called a council to talk the matter over, young Scipio declared that it was no matter for taking counsel. They must be bold and act not to liberate in the face of this great evil. Let them take arms and go with him at once. As many as wished to save the state, no camp was so truly the camp of the enemy as one where such thoughts were rife, and he proceeded with only a few followers to the quarters of Metellus, where he found a gathering of the young men of whom he had been informed, and raising his sword over their heads as they sat in the consultation, he swore, I solemnly swear that even as I myself shall not desert the republic of the Roman people, so likewise shall I suffer no other Roman citizen to do so, and if I willingly speak false, may Jupiter utterly destroy me, my house, house, my family, and my estate. Marcus Caecilius, I call on you and the others who are present to swear under these terms, and if any of you dare to refuse to swear, let him know that against him the sword is drawn and waits to drink his blood. Quaking as though they beheld the victorious Hannibal in the flesh, they all took the blood oath and delivered themselves into the custody of noble Scipio. End quote. Scipio ready to cut some fools. He's ready to cut. He's going to shank him. <laughs> it's this kind of determination and will that saves nations, that dominates states, that forces money to obey the higher callings of power and spirit. We see this same determination in Yamamoto Tomo's Hagakuri, the book of the samurai. Compare Scipio's resolve to this story from the Hagakuri. One year at a great conference, there was a certain man who explained his dissenting opinion and said he was resolved to kill the conference leader if it was not accepted. His motion was passed. After the procedures were over, they asked the samurai, their assent was too quick. And he responded, yes, they are too weak and unreliable to be counselors to the master. End quote. So things don't go your way at the meeting? Threaten everybody with death. That's what I do. <laughs> How's that going to go over, right? Oh, that's a, that's a long way to the top. Well, that's the kind of people, in moments of conflict, severe crisis, these are the kind of things that happen in a society. Stand could it happen ground, here? Man. It could. I, I Hey, I remember I saw with my own eyes live reports of people defending their property during Hurricane Katrina with yeah. uh, assault rifles. Mm-hmm. And during the L.A. riots, I remember there were people that defended yeah. their businesses. Yeah, Koreans in the grocery store. That's right. Uh, so it does, in times of crises, people take these matters into their own hands, which I'm definitely not advocating at all. So in, <laughs> two, in 210 B.C., Scipio's military service and reputation gained him control of all the Roman armies in Spain. He was only 24, 24 years old. In 210 B.C., Scipio's military service and reputation gained him control of all the Roman armies in Spain at the young age of 24. Scipio was going to fight Carthage's second-string generals in Spain, learning the Carthaginian way of war, learning and honing his battlecraft for years before facing Hannibal himself. In this, he reminds me of the Duke of Wellington who fought in Portugal and Spain for years before facing Napoleon at Waterloo. Anyways, while fighting in Spain, Scipio faced Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal, at the Battle of Bacula in 209 BC. He defeated Hasdrubal in part by completely departing from the standard Roman battle tactics. Now, I like that. He's not tied to tradition. No, he's flexible. Yeah, we see that a lot with uh, really great generals uh, throughout history. They break the standard tactics they learned in the textbooks, but they do it in a masterful way. You know, we don't talk often about the people that break them and fail utterly, <laughs> which often... <laughs> yeah, history is written by the winners, not the guy that um, marched all of his army off a cliff. Yeah. Well, anyway, so Hasdrubal was slightly outnumbered during this battle, but not too bad, and so he picked a very strong position at the top of a ridge, he's got the high ground, in order to use the ground to compensate for his weakness in numbers. Sounds smart, right? This is Hasdrubal. He's a stand-up guy. We talked about him last episode. Now, here is how modern historians T.A. Dory and D.R. Dudley describe the Battle of Bekula. Scipio sent his light-armed troops, supported by a picked body of heavy infantry, up the slope in front of Hasdrubal's position. 
The ridge at the top and the terrace below were guarded by light-armed troops. The Romans fought their way up the terrace and got a footing on the ridge at the top. Rather than sacrifice the advantage of his position, Hasdrubal hurriedly led his army out of camp and started to draw it up to defend the ridge, expecting the light-armed men to be followed up by a front attack. But Scipio had divided his main force into two. This was unheard of in Roman military doctrine. And he led these troops round on each side and were advancing up the rugged slopes at the sides of the plateau. Hasdrubal didn't even think men could come up that way. Now, Hasdrubal, while still in the process of getting his men into line, found himself attacked on both flanks at once. He realized that his position was now untenable, and at once extricated himself with as many men as he could. Scipio took 12,000 prisoners. End that's, quote. That's another thing we usually see, too. It's when a general, especially in the, mid, in the ancient times and medieval times, could divide their forces and flank a defending force. Scipio killed or captured approximately 14,000 Carthaginians while losing only about 2,000 of his own men. However, Scipio did not follow up his victory by chasing Hasdrubal, and Hasdrubal was able to cross the Alps and invade northern Italy. Now imagine if Hasdrubal had those 12,000 men Scipio killed at Bacula. Then the Battle of Metaurus would have been an extremely different animal. I'm convinced Hasdrubal would have won at Metaurus with those 12,000 extra troops. Scipio is owed accolades for the Roman victory at Metaurus. Rome had scored one point on the board. Carthage has three. So he didn't follow him out of Italy, or Spain? He tried to stop him, remember? He blocked his position mm-hmm. uh, on the standard route from uh, Spain to northern Italy. Uh-huh. So, guess what Hasdrubal does? He goes around, and we mm-hmm. talked about that. In that's the last... right, that's right. Yeah. And also, Scipio was, Scipio was commanding that force. Yes, that yeah. was trying to block him. Was trying to block him. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, recap. Three years later, at the Battle of Alippa, in 206 BC, Scipio faced off against Hannibal's second brother, Mago. Here's how one modern historian describes what happened. Quote, Scipio's tactics were sheer military genius. He evolved a plan by which... He used his weakest troops, the Spaniards, to pin down the strength of the enemy line without coming into action, while he used his best troops to destroy the weaker section of the enemy's army and leave himself in a position of immense tactical superiority that he could then exploit against the hard core of the enemy. For the first few days, the two armies drew up opposite each other on the plain. They skirmished between the two lines. Both armies were drawn up in the conventional pattern, with the best troops forming the center of both lines. So for a few days... They're, they're skirmishing, no big actions happening. The same thing's repeating itself. But on the evening before the day he had chosen for the battle, Scipio ordered his men to take their breakfast early. So he's changing the pattern and march out of camp as soon as it was light, with the weak Spaniards in the middle and the Romans on the wings. Mago was taken completely by surprise. The two armies had developed a routine of waiting in camp till light in the day. Now, with the Roman army marching out at daybreak and the cavalry and light-armed men coming right up to the walls of his camp, he had once ordered his men out and drew them in before they had time to get their breakfast. Having set the stage, Scipio deliberately waited many hours to allow the growing hunger and the midday heat to take their toll on the enemy's resistance. At last, after they are racked with hunger and sitting in the blazing sun, he withdrew his cavalry and light arm troops, placing them behind the wings, and began to advance on Mago. Now Scipio is showing his genius. Like Hannibal at the Battle of Trebia, Scipio uses surprise and the lack of food to weaken his army before he attacks. Scipio knows his Spanish troops are weak, so he places them in the center and doesn't let them attack. Instead... He sends them forward to threaten the Carthaginian center so Mago Barca's best troops cannot help his weakest troops on the wing of Mago's army. As the Spaniards advance, Scipio has his best Roman soldiers form into column formation and march parallel to the Carthaginian line in a capital letter L line of attack. Scipio's men are forming a rectangle around Mago's army. Now, Scipio doesn't close the rectangle on the back behind the Carthaginians, so there's a path for the Carthaginians to retreat. The Roman infantry are hooking into the Carthaginian line, just like knights hook in chess, two spaces to the right and one space up. Now, to the extreme right and left of these wings, Scipio places his cavalry and light arm troops. These troops begin to attack the rear of the Carthaginian wings. Mago is unable to reinforce and protect these wings because of the threat of the Spaniards, who are lingering just out of reach in the center of the battle. 
Now Scipio begins to close the rectangle. He's pushing the walls of the rectangle in. He's sandwiching the Carthaginians. Not only that, but Mago's elephants go wild and attack his own troops. Mago is smart. He knows he is losing, and a trap is suffocating his army. Accordingly, he pulls his best men, all his men, back into his fortified camp, losing many of his men in the process. And during the night, many of his Spaniards defect or desert. Mago no longer has enough men to face the Roman army. Accordingly, he retreats, whereupon Scipio methodically mops up his men in the retreat. After it was all over, Mago escaped with a few thousand men. The rest of his army, an army of over 45,000 men, was destroyed killed, captured, or deserted. This was the second canai. Because of this battle, Carthage abandoned Spain, and Scipio is made consul. The score stands Rome 2, Carthage 3. In 204 BC, Scipio takes an army and invades Carthaginian territory in North Africa, what is modern-day Tunisia. He establishes a beachhead at the town of Utica, but is surrounded by a large Carthaginian army, 35,000 men strong. So the armies are facing each other, and Scipio sends a diplomat to negotiate peace. It's a good idea, right? Scipio is threatening, Carth- threatening Carthage with an army in North Africa, just like Hannibal is threatening Rome in Italy. We'll have a little powwow, we'll reach a peace settlement, we'll make peace. No problem, right? Yeah, right. It's like when you're playing uh, uh, online RTS. You <laughs> want the other guy to go threaten the other, the other team's player. Get his army from beating yours. Well, yeah, normally they'd be right, but... In this case, it's wrong, and here's why. This is Scipio we're talking about. He dresses his senior military leaders as servants and uses them to spy on the Carthaginian camp during diplomatic negotiations. Now, these negotiations last all winter long. Scipio is having his military spies reconstruct the entire layout of the Carthaginian camp each day. Moreover, the Carthaginian camp is split into two different large groups, and one group has winter quarters made entirely of highly flammable reeds. (laughs) Or inflammable. (laughs) At this time, Scipio seizes the initiative. He pretends to prepare to attack the city of Utica. So he's getting ready to attack the city not the army camps of the Carthaginians, but actually he leads his men out at 9 o'clock at night for a night attack on the Carthaginian camp. Modern historians T.A. Dory and D.R. Dudley pick up the story. Quote, As they approached the enemy camps, the Roman army split into two. The operation was a complete success. While one group surrounded one camp, the other group set fire to the nearest rows of huts. The fire spread through the dry buildings and soon engulfed the whole camp. The occupants, made utterly unsuspicious by the prolonged peace talks, thought the fire was accidental and rushed out, some half asleep and some half drunk to put it out. In the turmoil, many were trampled underfoot, others burnt to death, and those who the flames had spared perished by the sword. The Carthaginians assumed that the Numidian camp had been set fire by some mishap, and they rushed out unarmed either to help or to watch. Scipio fell upon them, drove them back into their own lines, and set fire to their huts. Both camps were completely wiped out in this double holocaust. The Carthaginians escaped with just 2,000 men. Around 30,000 men were killed, and the Carthaginians no longer existed as an organized fighting force. End quote. Chris, I gotta say, man, what do you think of Hannibal and Scipio? Well, Hannibal's, Hannibal's kind of the guy that's been around for a while. He's- marching around Rome for about 15 years, set up his own little kingdom, his own dynasty, if you will, the Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide of the ancient world. And here comes Scipio, the Dabo Sweeney, the Clemson Tigers, just coming on the st- bursting on the scene with some of their best players and start to mop up Carthaginian forces in other parts of the ancient world. All right, so here's the score now. Rome has three points. Carthage has three. The game is tied. tied. That's right, all tied up. Hannibal sitting in Italy. Scipio sitting in Africa, right next to Carthage. The seventh battle would decide the series. And now, at this time, Carthage sues for peace. And they actually sign a peace treaty in 203 BC. Almost immediately, the armistice is broken because a Carthaginian fleet attacks and pillages a large Roman fleet. We're going to pillage Waffle House later. Waffle House! (laughs) I'm singing about Waffle House. (laughs) Hostilities are renewed, and the dormant armies come alive and begin to move again. It was now in the autumn of 202 BC that Scipio would face his greatest challenge, Hannibal Barca, the undefeated general 
Leading an army of veterans across the Mediterranean Sea to defend his homeland he hadn't seen in 17 years, the world had been in his hands like a Napoleon. But now fate was shining her star on another man. His name was Scipio Africanus. Yeah, old corny, old corny. <laughs> Stop corny it. Corny Africanus. Yeah, he's coming to get you, baby. <laughs> Stop it. Hey, Chris, you want to go ahead and set the battle for us? Yeah, the Battle of Zamo was fought in northwestern Tunisia, near its modern-day border with Algeria. The exact battle location is unknown. The Romans, though, fielded approximately 36,000 men. The Carthaginians fielded around 40,000 men and 80 elephants. The Romans had about 6,000 light cavalry, while the Carthaginians fielded only 4,000 horsemen. It was the battle that decided more than a war. It decided the fate of an entire civilization. As... Clausewitz notes, an enemy that is not destroyed may hide in time in order to strike his enemy. Carthage loses this battle. She would never recover. Now Hannibal's hardcore soldiers are about 15,000 veterans who had never tasted defeat under his command. They are fiercely loyal to Hannibal personally, and they remind me a lot of Napoleon's old guard and their dedication to Hannibal. The rest of his troops are new recruits or mercenaries. Hannibal has such little confidence in them, he doesn't even address them before the battle. He only addresses his hardcore veterans from his Italian campaigns. Think about these men. They've experienced a form of life many of us can hardly even imagine. Hannibal intervened and dictated where they lived, if they had families or not, how they fought and what they ate. And they loved him for it because he gave them cities and women. He gave them victories and money. Most of humanity will never know war for that long of a time. Even our modern-day military veterans don't experience the same kind of identification with one man and one man alone. Our career military troops serve under various different commanders during a career and are not given cities to loot and women to take. All of these men have served with and personally identify with Hannibal alone. They are 15- to 17-year veterans. In a war that lasts as long as that, Hannibal is a sort of father to these men. He's more than just a general. He would lead them into battle one last time. Now, the night before the battle, Scipio agrees to meet Hannibal. The two commanders consider making peace or betting everything on a roll of a dice, a turn of the flop. Wouldn't you want to be a fly on the wall in that meeting? During this meeting, Hannibal offers Rome every province outside Africa. This is a huge concession for Hannibal to make. Think about it. All of Spain, all of Sicily, all of southern Gaul, what we call France today, all the cities Hannibal had taken in Italy, all of it would be given to Rome. It's a good deal. We can see from this deal that Hannibal recognizes Scipio to be his equal. Here is how Livy describes the meeting of these two world shakers. Quote, between the two generals, a meeting place was chosen, in open ground to avoid any possibility of ambush. The armies were moved back from the meeting point by an exactly equal distance, and there the two generals met, each with a single interpreter. They were the two greatest generals of their age, the equals of any king or commander of any nation in the whole of human history. At first, neither said a word, as if each was awestruck at the sight of the other, each lost in admiration of his opponent. Hannibal was the first one to speak. It was I who first began this war against the Roman people, and though I seem so often to have victory in the very grasp of my hand, fate has willed it that I should also be the first to seek for peace. I come of my own free will, and I am glad that it is you from whom I seek it. There is no one I would rather ask it of. This is indeed one of Fortuna's richest jokes, that I first took up arms when your father was consul. I fought against him, first of all, Rome's generals, and now, without my arms, I am here to seek peace terms from his son. It would have been better if the gods had given our ancestors a different attitude of mind, a willingness to be content with what they had, Rome with Italy, Carthage with Africa, but sadly. Though we may regret the past, we cannot change it. You saw the arms and standards of a Punic army at the very gates and beneath the very walls of Rome. We now hear the roar of a Roman camp from the walls of Carthage. The luck is turned and Fortuna is on your side. But the issue we must decide now is peace. And for both of us, peace is the greatest prize of all. Whatever we decide upon, our states will ratify. As for myself, time sees me now an old man. Returning home to the native land I left when I was a boy and I don't recognize. You are young, and luck has always been on your side. This, I fear, will make you too aggressive when what we need is quiet diplomacy. The man who has never been deceived by Fortuna rarely thinks carefully about the uncertainties of mortal destiny. 
You stand today where I once stood at Trazamine and Kanai. Almost before you reached military age, you held supreme command. You avenged your family's calamities. Like battle honors, you won a glorious renown for courage. They made you consul, won others like the guts to fight for Italy. But you went further, and you sailed out to Africa. There you slaughtered two armies, captured and fired two camps, and seized innumerable cities in our kingdom and our empire. And now, finally, you have dragged me out of Italy after 16 years of stubborn occupation of that land to man of action victory can often seem a greater prize than peace i too was once a man of action indifferent to practical decisions and once upon a time on me too fortuna smiled forget everything else I am proof enough of how Fortuna changes. Not so long ago, I pitched my camp between the river Enio and Rome. You saw me preparing to attack, about to scale the very battlements of Rome itself. Now look at me now. Here I stand, bereaved of two brothers, heroes both, and famous generals standing before the walls of my beleaguered country, pleading with you to spare my city those ordeals with which I once threatened yours. The more Fortuna smiles upon you, the less she should be trusted. Peace is yours to give, and the rewards will bring you many blessings. Peace is ours to beg for, and for us there are no honorable rewards. We beg because we must. The certainty of peace is a better thing by far than a victory you can only hope for. Peace is yours to give. Victory rests in the hands of the gods only. Compare your own strength with the power of Fortuna and the chance of battle which we both share. For both of us, swords will be drawn and men's lives will be lost. All the glory that you have and hope for Fortuna can turn away in a single hour. If you make peace, Cornelius, yours is the world and everything that's in it. If not, then you must take whatever Fortuna may grant. The integrity of any peace agreement much depends on those who seek it. It is I, Hannibal, that asked for peace. I was responsible for the war, and as long as heaven was on my side, I worked to see that none of my people regretted my decision. In the same way, I shall now work with all my my might to see that none regret the peace that I have gained for them. The Romans' general reply went roughly as follows. I am very well aware, Hannibal, that it was... The hopes raised by your return that led the Carthaginians to breach the terms of the armistice and wreck any hope of future peace. You have been very frank about it. You are actually asking for to profit from your treachery, even though you do not deserve to retain even the original conditions. Our ancestors did not start the war in Sicily. We did not start the war in Spain. In Sicily, it was our allies who were under threat. In Spain, it was the sack of our cities, which drove us to take up arms in two, in two just and holy wars. You have acknowledged, and the gods are witness to the truth of what you say, that you are the aggressors. Justice and the laws of heaven gave us victory in Sicily. They have given us victory in the recent war, and they will do so again if we fight here. As for myself, I am all too aware of human weakness, and there is no need to lecture me on the powers of Fortuna. I know very well that all of our deeds are subject to a thousand strokes of luck. If you had come to ask me for peace of your own free will before you abandoned Italy, I would be all too willing to admit that my conduct in the past was high-handed and unfair. But I have no such inhibitions when we are here in Africa, on the eve of battle, and I have dragged you protesting and against your will to these negotiations. Therefore, if you have anything you wish to add to the peace conditions previously proposed as compensation, perhaps for the losses of our ships and our supplies, which you destroyed during the armistice, and for the violence done to our ambassadors, then I will have something to take back to our authorities. But if that is too much for you, prepare for war, since peace you clearly find intolerable. The two men parted. There would be no peace. Fortuna and the gods would decide their fate. And yours too, dear listeners. Fortuna smiles and frowns on your life too. Eight hours after Hannibal and Scipio's meeting, the Carthaginian and Roman armies made ready for battle. In Hannibal's front, he placed his 80 war elephants. Behind these, he placed his allied troops. Behind those allied troops, Hannibal placed his hardcore group of veterans. Both armies put their cavalry on either wing of their battle lines. Scipio recognized the threat posed by Hannibal's elephants to his front, and instead of drawing up his men in the usual Roman pattern of mutually supporting lines, Scipio lined his men up directly behind each other, forming lanes for the elephants to pass through. Again, he's showing his talent to to break away from Roman tradition. As they pass through, Scipio plans to use his lightly armed skirmishers to harass the elephants with missile fire and ultimately kill them. Now Hannibal begins the battle by unleashing the elephants with directions to disrupt the Roman battle lines. Most of the elephants attack the Roman infantry. 
These were promptly led down the lane Scipio had prepared for them by the prodding of the Roman missile troops. However, some of the elephants were scared by the Roman trumpets and attacked the Carthaginian cavalry on each wing of Hannibal's army. Scipio, seeing this, rushes his Roman cavalry to attack the disorganized Carthaginian cavalry. Under attack from the Romans and their own elephants, the Carthaginian cavalry fled the battlefield, pursued by the Romans. Now, some historians speculate that Hannibal did this on purpose to try and draw off the Roman cavalry from the battlefield, but no one knows for sure. Here's how modern historians describe the next stage of the battle. Quote, Then the infantry came to grips. At first, the skill and courage of the Carthaginian mercenaries gave them an advantage over the leading ranks of the Romans. But then the second Roman rank attacked, forced the Carthaginians back onto their second line. Here, there was some confusion, as the poorly trained local levies would not support the mercenaries and had to be driven into battle at sword point. End quote. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the uh, Soviet Union having to force poorly trained soldiers in a battle against the Nazis. When they came over in Operation Barbarossa. Yeah, it reminded me of that too. All right, so at this point, Scipio realizes his usual tactic of using his second and third battle lines to envelop the enemy, to attack them from both flanks, would not work. Hannibal's use of his hardcore veterans would make this tactic a devastating failure. In fact, Hannibal's prepared for that. So Scipio, showing his genius, changes tactics and drives his second line into Hannibal's front and forces Hannibal's new and experienced troops back into Hannibal's veterans. So he's pushing the newbies back on the veterans' line. Hannibal redeploys his veterans to either wing. So on both of the wings of his army, he's got his veterans. Scipio reorganizes his battle line too. He called back his frontline troops for the, from where they had been fighting. The battlefield literally had become slippery with blood and littered with heaps of dead men. Scipio made his second and third lines form column and moved through the battlefield in close order, and then deployed them on either flank of the frontline troops. Each army was now drawn up in one extended single line. They both charged and began the fight anew. The two sides were well matched. They were about equal in numbers. The Carthaginians began to make way through the Roman ranks. Victory for Hannibal was near, when, like Napoleon's old guard at Waterloo, the Roman cavalry returned and attacked the Carthaginians in the rear. The Carthaginians, the men who had devastated and conquered Spain, Gaul, and Italy, who had threatened Rome for 15 years, who had devastated countless Roman families and burned countless Roman homesteads, these same men broke and fled. Many were killed and many were captured. Hannibal's line collapsed. Rome had won the war. The Carthaginian Empire was completely broken. They retained a few small areas in North Africa. Its fleet was reduced to just ten warships. Carthage was forced to pay a huge indemnity to Rome. Finally, Carthage was forbidden to wage war on any people at all outside Africa, and on any people inside Africa without the consent of Rome. It was this clause that led to the Third Punic War. In the Third Punic War, Carthage was besieged for years, taken, ransacked, her people sold into slavery, and the land where the city stood literally was broken down and had salt thrown and sewn into it, so nothing could ever grow there again. The city, that had once terrorized the known world, was now a few lines of salt in the sand of North Africa, and you thought your commute was a problem, and you thought the girl that dances behind your eyelids at night was a problem. No friends. The people of Carthage knew what real problems are. Scipio returned to Rome to a hero's welcome and a successful career, not to mention immense wealth. For his part, Hannibal took supreme control of Carthage in 196 BC, where he absolutely ended corruption throughout the city. He was so successful against nepotism and corruption that the city had an economic miracle and was able to pay off her indemnity to Rome in 191 BC. Unfortunately, in 195 BC, Rome insisted that Hannibal be exiled from Carthage and Hannibal, who had given his life for his city. The man who had stood by it in its worst crises was exiled. Hannibal lived a vagabond existence, serving as a military advisor and hired general for a series of kingdoms until Rome put pressure on one king to deliver Hannibal to them. We don't know how or exactly when Hannibal was killed, but he died sometime after 183 BC. Fortuna had fled from him. Well, 
that's it for the show today, friends. Thanks for listening. We appreciate all the feedback we've been getting lately. We've heard the singing's been a big hit, so we're prepared for more of that in the future. <laughs> or not. But uh, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and visit us at thebattlecast.com for additional content. If you have questions or battle suggestions, especially if you have that 20-page paper due by the end of the semester, <laughs> then hit us up at, the, at battlecastnet at gmail.com. And that's it for me here at the North Georgia Bunker. Please remember to tell a friend and subscribe to the show. Check out our website-only podcast called Bonus Cast. It's only available on the website. That's a little bonus for Eva, who wanted more banter between me and Chris. And to sing us out is O Fortuna. It seems almost written for the Battle of Zama. Until next month, this is Luke wishing you good times and good weather with good people. Bye. Bye.